Hello, welcome back to Money Network. I'm joined today by Richard Williams, the CEO of Cornish Metals. Richard, good to, good to see you. Peter, thank you for having me. Um, let's kick things off just quickly with your background and a little bit of an overview of the company at the moment. Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm the CEO of Cornish Metals. Um, geologist by training. I've worked in the mining industry since the late 1980s. Uh, I joined Cornish Metals as its precursor company, Strongbow Exploration in 2015 and uh, the mandate at the time was to look for high quality tin projects in good jurisdictions and what we figured out fairly quickly is that there aren't many high quality tin projects available and the best one that we came across was South Crofty in Cornwall so that's the focus for the company going forward. Um, just want to touch on a few things that's happened this year but you're talking about high quality and why Why did you pick South Crofty? Obviously, from my understanding, it's very high grade, but could you just tell us a little bit about the deposit and its history? Yeah, the, there's a number of aspects that I think really tip the balance for us. Uh, when you look at most projects today that are in potentially the development phase, uh, permitting is, is a massive issue. And we benefited from the fact that South Crofty came with an existing mine permit that's valid until 2071. Um, it's got full planning permission to build a new process plant. Uh, because it's high grade and underground and it's in an urban environment, it's got a very small footprint and will have a minim minimum uh, impact on the local community. And on top of that, we met with local councillors, uh, local residents and figured out fairly quickly that the local community was very much supportive of, of seeing the mine back into production. So all of those aspects, I think, led us to make this decision. Good. All right. Okay. Well, this year, I think it was back in around, was it May? Vision. Correct. Yeah. So Mick Davies, Vision Blue, came yeah. in as a strategic investor. I think they're around 26%, right? That's right. At the moment. Can you just remind us what the terms were and, and what the use of funds are? Well, we started talking to Vision Blue late last year. It's a very interesting new uh, resources fund. They're focused on investments into what they call the transition metals or energy transition metals. Uh, they'd already made investments into a graphite project and a silica project in, in BC, graphites in, in Southern Africa and a vanadium project in, in Eastern Europe. And uh, when they started talking to us and started fully understanding the, the essential qualities of tin and how important it is to the electronics world, um, I think that really piqued their interest. Uh, you know, the jurisdiction was, was very good. And so after completing the due diligence, they came in with a, a very significant investment this year, 25 million pounds as part of a 40 million pound raise. And the use of proceeds from that is to take South Crofty through feasibility study. Uh, we'll be dewatering the mine, so we have to build a water treatment plant. And those funds will cover us for the next two and a half years. Okay. And um, can you just run us through the timeline to production as well? So within the next two and a half years, for example, I think that gets you to the construction decision, right? Yeah, correct. What do you have to do in that time period? Um, so the first step is to build the water treatment plant, which is underway currently. We've been beefing up the team. Uh, we're up to just over 30 employees now down in Cornwall, so it's, it's really growing rapidly. Um, we expect the water treatment plant to be constructed, commissioned and operational by certainly by the middle of next year. And then it's an 18 month period to dewater the mine. Now, at the same time, we'll be drilling to collect samples for metallurgical studies, ore sorting studies, uh, paste backfill studies. And that drill program has commenced already, so there's quite a lot of activity on the drilling side. And then that gets us to a point where we deliver a feasibility study uh, within two and a half years and then follow straight on 12 to 18 months construction of the process plant, development of the underground access to the various areas we want to mine. And so production timeline, if anything goes well, within, within four years. Brilliant. Okay. Um, looking aside from that, obviously, it isn't just South Crofty that is exciting at the moment. You did, I think it was 2020 Cornish Lithium were doing some drilling to look for. Yep. Geothermal and brine, yep. right? And they, they come across some pretty exciting copper intercepts, especially at United Downs. Yep. Could you just remind us a little bit of those intercepts and what the relationship is with Cornish Lithium? Yeah, so when, when we acquired the assets in Cornwall, uh, the, the principal asset was obviously South Crofty because it is, it's got a long history of mining and it was the, the area that was most recently a mine in Cornwall. Um, but alongside that, we had about 15,000 hectares of other mineral rights, some of which covered former producing mining areas, uh, one of which would be the United Downs project. Um, United Downs, very interesting area. Um, you've got two historic, very high grade copper mines, 
One was called uh, Great Consoles and the other one was called United Mines. And then to the east of those, you had the Monk Wellington Mine, which operated until uh, the early 90s, uh, late 80s, early 90s. And then the Wheel Jane Mine, uh, slightly further east on strike from Monk Wellington, which closed, I think, in 1992. Uh, so it's, a very, it's been a very productive area from a metal perspective. But when you look at Cornwall as a whole, you realize that although there's been a lot of mining, there's been very little in the way of mineral exploration. And we had an agreement with Cornish Lithium where they could explore for lithium in brines. And one of the areas they drilled was right between United Mine and Consolidated Mines. And they went through 14 meters, around 7.5% copper, um, over 2% tin. Um, so very, very exciting new discovery, and that allowed us to list the company on AIM in February 2021. Uh, so we've been drilling there over the last year. Uh, we found multiple targets, multiple drill intercepts. Um, some areas are copper rich, others are tin rich, some areas are zinc rich, and there's also a, a silver component with that as well. So, you know, we're in the process of assessing what the next steps would be for that. But I think one, one of the highlights that we should talk about is at South Crofty, because we do have a permit to build a processing facility, there's the opportunity that that could become a hub for smaller operations in and around a reasonable transport distance from South Crofty, where we can process the ore and obviously um, we don't need to permit other, yeah. other processing plants. So essentially that will turn into a satellite deposit for... That's, that's the plan, yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay, and how does that change the metallurgy and, and the way you might have to set up the processing plant, say for example at South Crofty, if, if you've yeah. now got, got copper in mind and zinc in mind. Yeah, yeah look, you know, the, the, again, the, <laughs> the, the very nice thing about South Crofty is because it's a high grade tin deposit, uh, it's hosted in granites, um, there's no sulfides associated with it or very little. Um, so it's a very simple process to recover the tin. When the mine was in production up until its closure in 1998, the ore was processed at Wheel Jane. They were recovering about 90, 88 to 90% of the tin mm. through gravity and, and flotation processes. So when we looked at the opportunities that were in front of us, it made sense to focus on South Crofty. I talked about the permits already, uh, but also from a capital cost to build the mine, it's a very straightforward, simple processing um, approach. If we were to incorporate you know, copper, zinc uh, into that, we would have to add on um, different flotation circuits, a zinc circuit, a copper circuit, to create different concentrates. So I think the initial phase for us is to focus on what we have at South Crofty now, move that through to a production decision, and then look at other opportunities that we can bring okay. in. And what's, what's the exploration plan looking like? Obviously you were saying you were assessing options at the moment, right? But yeah. you've also got the partnership with Cornish Lithium. Are they looking to do any more exploration on your licenses or are you planning to do any more yourself on those licenses? To sort of discover a bit more? Yes, um, you know, we, so Cornish Lithium, I can't talk too much about what they want to do, but I know that they are, there are plans to do additional drilling to look for lithium in brine opportunities and, um, and certainly some of those targets would lie within some of our mineral rights. Um, and as and when that gets decided upon, we'll obviously announce that to the market. Um, from our own perspective, um, anybody that goes onto the website will see that obviously United Downs has got some very interesting drill results from the last year which need further evaluation. Uh, we've also got another project down to the southwest called uh, Guinea, uh, where there was an old copper mine called Wheel Alfred. Uh, we believe that there's some significant potential there. What, what our kind of geological model is, um, basically you've got two distinct rock types in the region. One is called Kiles, which is a sedimentary rock which hosts the polymetallic copper, zinc, tin, sometimes tungsten mineralization. And as you get deeper into, into the ground, you get into these underlying granites, and that's where you get high-grade tin mineralization. Um, a lot of the old mines in Cornwall really only focused on the near-surface high-grade copper. So a lot of those areas, United Downs being a good example, we feel that as we get in deeper, we're seeing more tin, and there's potential for underlying higher-grade tin mineralization. Um, we expect that to be the case in other targets throughout Cornwall. Um, let's have a look at the tin outlook at the moment. Um, obviously, I think we spoke to uh, the International Tin Association back in January and they were extremely bullish in terms of yeah. stockpiles were reducing. Uh, there was hardly any new projects coming back online. And there was a really good thematic around the tin market, right? Mm -hmm. 
Obviously, we've seen the tin price fall a little bit or come off a little bit since then, but similar to copper, it's, it's base metals in general have been battered a little bit. Yep. But looking forward, what, what's your view? What are you hearing in the market? And, and I guess even thinking of people like Vision and, and other investors yeah. you speak to, what's, what's, what's you the know, sort we, of opinion? We, we've looked at, um, as I touched on earlier, we've looked at a number of tin projects that have the potential to become new mines. Um, but a lot of them, t that all takes time. Um, when you look at the projections for tin demand uh, going forward, especially now with this drive to net zero, uh, the need for renewable power, uh, power storage, electric vehicles, uh, the rollout of 5G, um, cloud-based storage systems for data, um, all of these things require tin. So, t you know, it's a very simple um, requirement for tin. It's a solder connecting semiconductors um, to uh, copper wiring in all these applications. But because there's so many of them, the demand for tin is only going to grow. And right now, there's no suitable replacement for tin. Uh, the watershed moment, I think, for tin uh, was about 20 years ago when the EU passed legislation um, outlawing the use of lead solder and the the only replacement was tin. So what we've seen over the last 20 years is any of the stockpiled or warehouse tin has been consumed. And we're at the point now where, you know, we're at that supply demand balance. And obviously through COVID, I think one of the things we saw was a lot of people moving towards working from home. So you needed better computing capacity, better online connectivity. Uh, that led to an increase for new laptops, um, better Wi-Fi connections. And um, that led to a, a really strong run up in the tin price. If you look at, you know, you step back from that period, but you look at where the world is going, uh, the International Tin Association is projecting demand in the order of 500 to 550,000 tons of tin per year by 2030. That's an increase of about 150,000 tons per year, um, you know, about 40% increase in, in current demand. There's really not enough projects out there right now to meet that demand. And because of what you just touched on, you know, we, we've come into a market here where there's a lot of uncertainty due to political risk that we see in, you know, Russia, Ukraine, China, Taiwan, um, that may make some of these other development projects take a lot longer to come on stream because it's more difficult to access capital. Uh, fortunately for us, we don't need to worry about that for the next two and a half years. We are funded to push the project forward. Perfect. Okay, and the last thing I wanted to touch on because it, it it only it was only released last month, right? And being a British company, I thought you might have an opinion on this. But tin's obviously been added to the critical metals list. With yep. the UK have finally got a critical metals list. Yep. Um, what what do you think that means, or what could that mean in terms of implications for global trade and and really just the mining and mineral sector in the UK in general? Now that we we seem to be focusing on it a little bit more. Yeah. It, it's something that people in the industry, I think, have recognized for a long time, not just specific to tin, but the mining industry, is that we've become reliant on other countries for the smelting, processing, refining, manufacturing of a number of different um, products. And I think the last six to nine months have really highlighted how fragile that reliance has become. Um, so I think there's a push by governments around the world, the US, Canada, UK, Australia, um, to look at the important minerals that they need to achieve these, this energy transition that's drive towards net zero, and then look domestically to see where they can access some of those minerals that they need. And, you know, in the UK, we're blessed with uh, geological endowment in, in Cornwall, where you've got historic high-grade copper mines, tin mines, zinc mineralization, some silver, lithium potential, and part of the drivers of this are really to secure the supply that you need to have your own domestic car manufacturing, electric car manufacturing industry, your own domestic renewable power uh, generation capacity. And on top of that, I think you've seen private companies, you know, car manufacturers, doing specific deals with individual mines to secure the source of, say, lithium or nickel or cobalt. Um, and I, I think that's going to be a theme going forward because when research analysts come out and they look at the demands of certain metals to achieve these goals, there's not enough supply out there. So if the big 
end user companies really need to secure that supply, they're going to have to make those investments. And I think that may be a change that you see on the, on the finance inside of, of our industry. So actually the end users or, or those who are creating the end product need to really start getting involved a bit more in that. I, th I think so. And, and there's also a recognition now, you know, ESG is very important in all, my, all walks of life today and certainly in, in the mining industry. And end users and, e and even consumers um, are quite focused on where the materials within certain appliances come from. So, you know, if you're buying an Apple product or a Google product or a Samsung product, you want to know that, you know, the tantalum or, or the cobalt or the tin within these appliances are sourced responsibly. You know, they're not funding uh, conflict. They're not exploiting child labor. They're not resulting in large scale environmental destruction. And we can tick all of those boxes down in Cornwall. Um, and not only that, I think in Cornwall where we are, you know, you've got strong support for the mine to go into production. And part of the reason for that is that Campbell, Cambon, Pool, Red Ruth, they really associate with the history of mining in that area. And, you know, we can bring a lot of employment to the area, high paid, well, highly skilled um, employment opportunities that I think will really benefit the local economy. Yeah. And just, I guess, just to finish up on, Cornwall obviously used to be the, one of the world's largest mining districts, right? I mean, do you, it, it was, do, and you do know, you I think vision that we're <laughs> it's going to come back. I, I think we're very close to it. Yeah. You know, we we've still got Cambone School of Mines. Um, it's now part of Ex Exeter University, and Cambone has produced some of the world's best mining engineers, mineral process engineers, mining geologists, surveyors, and you know, you, you can see that when you look at companies across the world and look at the senior management, many of those people have come out of Cambone School of Mines. Um, so we have a wealth of experience down in Cornwall that we can rely on. And, you know, I think once you get one mine into production, it sends the right message to the investment community that the government is supportive, that you can come in, invest money and build mines. Um, from our perspective, we think that's achievable in the next four years. Perfect. All right, Richard, great to see you again. Okay, thank you, Peter.